If you're a rogue robot trainer and want to get Eclipse set up to join this coding party, I'll link the setup tutorial in the description. All right, so let's open up Eclipse, restore the workspace, and get settled in. Now it's time for a new project. I'm gonna go to File, New, and then Arduino Project. I'm naming mine Sting the Catapult because that is what the robot is. Make sure use default location is checked and let's do this thing. And don't forget to make sure that the project is selected in the launch configuration tab. So there are a couple new things we wanna do in this code. For one, we wanna program Sting to be drivable with our handy dandy PS2 controller. And we also want Sting to use an ultrasonic sensor to tell us when we're up against that barricade. The one thing stopping us from writing all the commands for the controller and the ultrasonic sensor is that Eclipse will have no idea what we're talking about. The way to get Eclipse to recognize and accept the command for the controller and sensor is in our program to point Eclipse to a bunch of background code that will explain to Eclipse what's going on. Now all that background code is called a library and to point Eclipse to a library you have to include that library in your project and include that library's header file at the top of your program. And see we already got one right here. So all the commands that we use for our Arduino would be aired out by Eclipse but we include the Arduino library's header file at the top of our program and that says hey Eclipse Here's all that funky code that makes all the Arduino commands make sense to you. So now what we need to do is get our little hands on a library for the ultrasonic sensor and a library for the PS2 controller. If you're in Nerdy Girls, they already live on your computer in a file called .arduinocdt. If you're rogue, go ahead and refer to section 13 of the Eclipse for level 3 tutorial that I'll link in the descrizzle below. So now we need to add the ultrasonic and PS2 libraries to our project. Right click on the project, hit properties, libraries, sensors, check it, click apply, and close. Finally, to include the library's header files in this code, we type hashtag include ultrasonic.h with the little, with these guys, and ps2x underscore lib or lib.h. So now we can build it and make sure it likes those sweet little library inclusions. Now, we shall begin. Our goals for tonight are to 1. Get Sting drivable via tank drive, 2. Enable auto reloading so that we can easily load boulders into the catapult. Three, we want to build a macro that will run at the touch of a button where Sting drives forward until it sees a wall, then it stops, shoots, and then drives backwards to whence it came. Okay, first things first, we want to confirm that the receiver can communicate with the controller by having the Arduino print some info about the controller to the terminal. To do that, we can use an example program that lives in the PS2 library. Now this example sketch is a .ino, which we can open with the Arduino IDE, but we want to open it in Eclipse. So the easiest way to do that is to make a new project in Eclipse called something like controller test, and then include the PS2X library in the properties, and then copy and paste the contents of the example code and build. But we do want to edit a couple of things. Since we're using an Arduino Mega and not an Uno, the pins that the receiver is plugged into are different than they are here. And so notice how the sketch uses define to give pin numbers names. We've been creating variables like this to assign pin numbers, but just know that using the define directive is another way you can do that. So on our receiver, the pins are actually DAT, CMD, ATT, and CLK. So we wanna change the SEL to ATT. If you wired your receiver how we did, we used port 51 for DAT, 50 for CMD, 53 for ATT and 52 for CLK. So this command, serial.begin, kind of initializes the Arduino to print stuff to the terminal. The number that you pass to this begin function sets the speed of how fast data is sent to the terminal. Generally, the number I use here is 9600. So then it checks for errors and will tell you if anything's wrong or if it found the controller. Then it will check the type of controller and print it. We want dual shock. Then we enter this loop and it'll check if any buttons are pressed, and if they are, it'll print that they are being pressed. So now let's plug in the Duino, but no need to turn the bot on just yet. So first, let's make sure that the download target that we set up last time is targeting the correct port on the computer that the robot's plugged into. I'll check device manager and then edit the download target to match that. Then let's make sure that the launch configuration is set to the right program. I want controller test. So now let's set up a terminal to print info from the COM port that you're plugged into, and make sure that the target and the data speed are correct. Now let's turn on that controller, and if it's on but the lights aren't on, hit that start button. Now let's compile slash build the code and then run it. So now the correct output should be outputting. <laughs> so it found it, identified the type, and as I press the buttons, they're printing to the screen. 
If you get an error, try running it again, and if you keep getting errors, check your wiring. One little thing to notice is that if you hit the upper bumper buttons, it'll print out the coordinates of the joysticks. If I hold the joysticks all the way up and then hit the bumper button, it'll print that their Y coordinate is zero. And if I do the same with them all the way down, their value will be 255. So just remember that all the way up is zero and all the way down is 255, and that'll come in handy later. By the way, if you unplug the Arduino, the terminal window will close, so if you want to retest it, you have to open a new terminal. So We've tested it, it works. Now let's get on to tank drive. First things first, we want to set up the three pins that the motors are plugged into on the Arduino. So I'm going to create some variables, all of type byte, and assign them the pin numbers to store. For the drivetrain motors, since you swapped which side was left and which was right, you can set them up like you did for Dark Rider, which would be left motor is 2, 3, and 4, and right motor is 5, 6, and 7. That way forward is still forward, even though the opposite end of the drivetrain is the front of it on sting. And the catapult pins are plugged into 8, 9, and 10, input 1, input 2, and PWM. And that rhymed. Wow. The limit switch is plugged into 22, and we'll wait on the ultrasonic sensor for just a sec. Now in setup, we want to define if each of these pins are inputs or outputs using the Arduino library's pin mode function. All those pins related to the motors are going to be output, but the limit switch is going to be input underscore pull up. We use input underscore pull up instead of just input when we want to activate the little secret pull up resistor associated with that pin on the Arduino so that current can pass through the switch, but not too much current. We don't want too much. Okay, now it's the fun part, setting up that PS2 controller. So I'm going to assign the pins to the four corners of the receiver. So here's a fun little trick with variables, the data that they store is editable, meaning that all you have to do is change the number that it stores to assign it a new number. So at this point in the code, PS2 underscore DAT got changed to 100 which would be bad because that's not where it's plugged in and that pin doesn't even exist. If the thought of accidentally editing a variable's value keeps you up at night, fear not! All you have to do is make a constant variable by adding const at the beginning of the declaration and that makes the value unchangeable in your code. Wow! Just know that constant variable names are generally all uppercase with words separated by underscores just like they are here. Next up we're going to do something called creating an object and you don't need to worry about going deep with objects now, just know that in order to run all of these PS2 commands we need to create a PS2 type object. So we say that this object is of the type PS2 by typing PS2x and then whatever we want to call the object, I'll do controller. So all this is saying is that we're creating a new object called controller of the type PS2x. And we'll create some variables to store different information later on in the code. We need one to store level of vibration, that can be an integer, and we'll make it store zero. So then we need two booleans, and a boolean variable can either be set to true or false. We want two boolean variables to store whether pressure and rumble modes are on, and for this project we don't want them on, so type false. Right in the beginning of setup, let's also give it a little delay to give the PS2 module time to start up. So these variables have values assigned to them, but where they actually get put to use is when we configure the controller. So to configure the controller, we need to type the name of the object we just created, and then call one of its functions called config underscore gamepad. And then we need to pass to it all the pins, which we have named PS2 underscore CLK, PS2 underscore CMD, PS2 underscore ATT, and PS2 underscore DAT. And then it wants to know if pressure sensing mode is on, and then we'll just give it our variable pressures, which says false, and then it also wants to know if rumble mode is on, and we'll just pass our rumble variable, which also says false. So now the gamepad is configured, so let's just leave some comments. Now it's time for tank drive. So when the code runs, it runs top to bottom, executes everything in setup top to bottom, and then enters the loop function where it runs over and over and over again. First thing we want to constantly do over and over and over again is check the joysticks positions and if any buttons have been pressed. To check, we can use the controller's function called read underscore gamepad, and you have to pass to it some stuff about controller vibration, I think, so we'll just put false, and it also wants vibration level, and we'll plug in our vibrate variable, which is zero. So starting with the left side, we finna set up an if, else, if, else structure because we have three scenarios. Either we're holding the joystick forward, we're holding the joystick backwards, or the joystick is in its middle neutral position. So what defines the joystick being forward? Well, we know that all the way forward is zero, all the way backwards is 255, and the middle has a value of about 128. So if the value of the left joystick, which we write like this, controller.analog, and then in parentheses, pss underscore ly, 
is greater than or equal to zero, but also remember that the double ampersand means and the value of the left joystick is less than or equal to that middle position, we want to go forward. Notice that I did 120 instead of 128 because I want a bit of a dead zone in the middle, and more on that later. Next up, otherwise if the joystick's all the way backwards, we want the left side to go backwards. So I'm going to copy and paste the condition, except let's think about what the range is. The joystick counts as backwards as long as its Y position is greater than or equal to the middle position, but less than or equal to the max position, which is 255. So I put 140 here as the lowest, even though the middle position is 128, because the joystick is sensitive, so I don't want the robot to move while the joystick is between 120 and 140. If the joystick is between 120 and 140, that doesn't fit either of these conditionals, so it'll go to the else where we'll want the robot to not move. Don't move. Okay, so now let's make the robot move based off the joystick. So first we know that motor power will change constantly depending on where the joystick is. So let's create a variable to store motor power. Let's add it to our list up here of type integer. And let's just start it off with medium power, so like 128. So now in this first if, we're gonna use a command to translate the joystick's position into the amount of power to give to the motor. Set motor power equal to, and then we'll use the map function, which we wanna give five things. The axis we're talking about, which is the y-axis or vertical position of the left joystick, then the minimum number of the range, which is zero, the maximum number of the range, which we made 128, the power you want to give when the joystick's all the way forward, which is full power, aka 255, and the lowest power you want to give when the joystick is right at 120, which is zero. So we're setting the motor power range from 0 to 255 depending on where the joystick is. So the way you've been coding the left side to move forward so far is to set the forward pin to high, the backward pin to low, and then you give the PWM pin a power value, which we would plug this motor power variable into so that as motor power is being updated, the power being sent to that left side is also being updated. And you can totally do it this way, but just know that the way you've been programming the drivetrain so far is to have it break once it reaches its goal. When driving your robot via controller, having it do hard stops can be kind of jarring, especially when you're going from full speed to hard stop. If you want the robot to not break, but release its motors, aka go into coast mode, I personally think it makes for a smoother driving experience, but feel free to keep in the hard stops if you like them. So to do that, all you have to do is flip-flop the way you give power. So instead of setting the forward pin to high and giving the PWM pin a power, we'll instead set the PWM pin to high using digital write and give the forward pin a power using analog write. Copy and paste everything you have here into here, aka when the joystick's pushed backwards. So we just gotta change what we're passing to this map function. The joystick range is now from 140 to 255, and the power range is from 0 to 255. We also gotta make sure the left backwards pin is getting the power instead of the left forwards pin. And in the else, aka when the joystick's in its dead AF zone, we want both the left forwards pin and the left backwards pin to receive no power. And finally, let's add a little small delay in the loop so that everything has time to get checked and executed before moving on to checking again. Go ahead and add some comments and then let's test it! Yay! Now here's the awesome news, you can actually copy and paste this whole if else if else structure and you only gotta tweak a couple of things to make it work for the right side. Basically anywhere you see an L or a left, replace it with an R or a right. TM. And test it, test it, test it, yay, 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 yay! Now let's move on to that sweet, sweet catapult. The first thing I want the catapult to do when I run the code is to get itself into a position where I can easily load a boulder into it. Now conveniently, we're using a limit switch that gets hit right as soon as the catapult gets itself into that position. I'm gonna actually make a function for reloading, and I'm gonna call it, you guessed it, reload. Forward declaration up here, function definition down here, and here's what I put in mind. So we set the catapult 2 pin high and catapult 1 low to get the gear rotating in the correct direction, and then I'm going to give the motor full power. And then we need to constantly check for the limit switch being pressed, so let's set up a while loop. While true will always run because true is always true. So inside let's put a check, and we're going to grab a reading of the limit switch using this function and say if it's low, aka if it's pressed, kill the power to the motor and use the break command to break out of this loop and resume where it left off. Before killing power to the motor though, I want to delay it by like 50 milliseconds. That way the arm reaches the perfect little position before stopping. Last step, call this function at the end of setup. 
Now, the Battle of Helm's Sheep is a teleop battle, meaning that you're in control of Sting via controller. But there's definitely a part of the battle that we can automate, aka put into a macro, which is a bunch of little steps that will execute when we hit a button. So we want the robot to drive forward until the ultrasonic sensor senses the barricade from about 10 centimeters away, at which point it will release the Kraken, and then it reloads and backs up to where it came from. I'm gonna st- <laughs> My widow macro. <laughs> So I'm going to store my macro in a nice little function, which I will call my whittle macro. In my little macro, I want to get the drivetrain moving forward in brake mode, so just like how we programmed it to beat Rainbow Road. Then we want to constantly check the ultrasonic sensor reading to see if the barricade is within that 10 centimeter range. So let's set up that good old wild true loop. Now we get to put that ultrasonic sensor library to use and set up some shoes for a sensor. So just like we created an object of type PS2X, we also want to create an object of type ultrasonic. We also need to pass to it the pins that Trig and Echo are plugged into, and yes, that order is important. So then down in the while loop of my little macro, we're going to check the distance. So if the distance that our ultrasonic sensor is reading is less than 10, notice we're using the dot read function here, and then what? We want to first stop the drivetrain, then shoot the boulder by having the catapult motor rotate for just a little bit, I put 200 milliseconds. And then we want to call that sweet, sweet reload function so that the catapult can get ready for a new boulder. And then we want to have it back up a bunch. I had it back up for one and a half seconds. And we break out of the loop with the break command and Sting resumes on its merry way. Let's go back up to the main loop and add a check for if the circle button is pressed. Do whatever you want and you can refer to the example code for the specific buttons, but I'm going to do the circle. And when the circle is pressed, my little macro is called. Test it, test it, test it. Test it, test it, test it. Don't forget to tweak it and break it. Now let's go get some sheep. Test it, test it, tweak it, tweak it, break it, break it. Tweak it. Don't forget to tweak it. Don't forget to tweak it and break it. Don't forget to break it. Test it. Start testing. Are you done? Test it, test it. Start testing. Keep testing. Over and over again. Don't stop. Please don't stop testing.